Hello. First, my sincere thanks to the organizers of the conference. I'm very happy to be invited and to give this talk today. My name is Juan Santiago from Stanford University, and I'm going to be talking to you uh, about capacitive deionization. In particularly, I'm going to be discussing some work we've done around um, showing self-similarity and resonance in capacitive deionization systems. Um, but along the way, I'm also going to present a couple other studies. And so I want to capture all of my collaborators. Um, so on some of the work I'll show on electrosorption, our collaborator is Professor Martin Bizant of MIT. And then through most of the talk on these issues of similarity and resonance and a couple of other issues, uh, we have collaborators at Lawrence Livermore National Labs who are very close collaborators with us over the years. And that's Michael Staterman, Stephen Hawks, and Patrick Campbell. So an outline for my talk, I'll first briefly introduce uh, capacity of denization and some of the motivations. Then I'll get into the first topic really, which is uh, thermodynamics, thermodynamics of electrosorption, um, followed by reduced order models that we use to understand and improve the performance of CDI cells. By way of introduction, I'll just show this heat map uh, from McConan and Hoekstra paper in 2016, which shows water scarcity throughout the world. And what they found is that uh, something like two thirds of the world's population experiences um, water scarcity, uh, uh, significant, severe water scarcity for at least one month out of the year. Within this global context, of course, we should consider the US market because it's an important um, higher margin market that's a, an important stepping stone uh, for any new technology. And I'll just point out that in the US, the 80% of the desalination market is in brackish water. And this is important for CDI and its development as a technology because um, uh, CDI is most applicable to brackish water. So as you know, in CDI, you have two porous electrodes. You apply a voltage between them. You keep the voltage low so you don't have electrolysis. You electrosorb ions. These are uh, sodium and chloride ions absorbed to the negative and positive electrodes. You push out the desalted water, bring in new feed water, and then you discharge the cell. You can uh, think about discharging it externally through an energy recovery circuit um, to create brine, and then you push out the brine. Right. So two things I want to say about this. It's an um, uh, inherently cyclical process. All right? You have to cycle through absorption, desorption cycles. And the other thing is that the inputs are electrical energy, where is the output that's wanted uh, is another commodity that's not energy, but drinking water. Um, and, and this makes a, a, a nice rich problem of coupled physics. So I'll just do a very brief review of, of CDI. Um, the study of porous electrodes goes back to the 60s. Uh, Newman at Berkeley developed um, some uh, porous electrode equations. These are transport equations uh, applicable within porous electrodes in their charging. The term CDI dates to, um, in fact, the 90s uh, from a group in, uh, in Livermore who developed even a company uh, in the late 90s. Um, uh, Bichevel, Martin Bichevel and Martin Bizant are two theoreticians, although Martin also does some experiments, uh, and they each, uh, both Martins do some experiments, um, but they've contributed very important um, models for electric double layers and porous electrodes, as well as uh, CDI. Um, some um, more recent, at least on a relative basis, are membrane CDI, which you've heard about um, at this conference, and also a couple of companies, but I want to jump right into um, uh, the motivation for CDI, which is uh, typically can do be done in different ways. But here I'm plotting the energy per unit volume of produced water as a function of concentration. On the left end is, is uh, drinking water and on the right end is seawater. We can see uh, the uh, specific energy required for uh, desalting seawater is probably best done with reverse os uh, osmosis. And, and that reverse osmosis, at least from large scale plants, which can take advantage of uh, the efficiency of large scale pumps and turbines, 
approaches the thermodynamic limit of, um, uh, of the Gibbs free energy of separation for seawater. And really the opportunities for CDI are in brackish water and especially in applications perhaps that are distributed where you can't take advantage of these large scale uh, efficiencies of a large plant. Now I indicate here uh, an estimate of what might be available, uh, what might be achievable uh, for brackish water using CDI. So in certain regimes, you can get a very significant saving relative to reverse osmosis. Um, of course, the physics are coupling of electrosorption, fluid flow, ion transport, and then reactions. And the reactions can be important for the surface charge of spontaneous surface charge of these electrodes. And at high enough potentials, um, we can have Faraday reactions, which steal energy from the process. So I first want to talk about the thermodynamics of electrosorption. This is uh, one paper, a uh, very nice collaboration. Uh, we had both theoretical and experiments that we had with Martin Bazant uh, of MIT. And what we did is perform a very basic um, thermodynamics uh, analysis of a basic cyclic electrosorption method where we absorb ions, pack them into the porous electrodes of, uh, uh, into the pores of a porous electrode, and then discharge it, um, releasing the ions into a reservoir and collecting them from a reservoir. Um, we started, uh, I, I, I won't cover all the details, but what I'll just say is we described the Gibbs free energy for any process, fairly general description, which applies to any Poisson-Boltzmann type process or physics. Um, and that um, uh, Gibbs free energy is expressed in terms of a volume interval, right? Which includes the uh, familiar uh, Poisson equation type terms um, and uh, a chemical uh, Gibbs free energy term for non electrostatic effects uh, forces and then a surface interval um, for, to account for the uh, surface charge on the, in, the, in the carbon. We then consider a cycle, a very simple cycling of uh, between two reservoirs of uh, one at high ion concentration, one at low ion concentration, and write equations for the cyclic amount of electrical input required and show that the, the most important um, um, finding of this study in, the, in terms of the theory is we show that the minimum electrical work required to attract ions, cram them into a small region, and then uh, uh, to release ions and, and, and even recover some uh, work. But the minimum in, uh, electrical work required to go through this cycle is equal can be shown to be equal to the Gibbs free energy of separation, right? Um, which is just related to the concentrations of the salt in the two output uh, regions. And this, you can only achieve this if you have um, absolutely no dissipation. So the sources of dissipation are then Faraday losses, uh, reactions at electrodes unwanted, and any and all resistive losses in the systems, which are of course very strongly rate dependent, rate dependent. So we did some experiments to explore uh, some of these limits uh, in thermodynamics. And one of the uh, techniques that we use is we embedded a titanium mesh into a porous carbon electrode to reduce uh, contact resistance and the resistance between the current collector and the ions in the pores. Um, and key is to try to remove this resistance while preserving capacitance. So we also minimize, for example, the spacer distance between the porous electrodes. We minimize Faraday losses by dwelling, uh, avoid dwelling uh, in the cycle at any time larger than about a volt. And we do some other operations um, to, to try to optimize this. This is an electrical impedance spectroscopy showing that we drastically reduce the resistance um, the characteristic internal resistance in these um, in the CDI cell. Um, so here is a plot of salts um, uh, normalized by the amount of energy 
uh, and the, the mass of the electrode as a function of uh, that specific salt per time, right? So this is like a throughput, you want this to be high, and this is amount of salt per energy, you want this also to be high. We show experimental results for four different flow rates. Each of these show a maximum as you vary current, as you increase current, right? Higher current meaning higher productivity. And the reason for this uh, maximum is easier to see if we focus in on one of the flow rates, where if you have too much current, yeah, you can keep increasing your throughput, your uh, productivity, but now the rate increases so much that you're resistive dominant. The resistances start to dominate the, the, the loss. And if you go too slowly and try to achieve the same salt uh, removal, well then you dwell too long your one voltage and your Faradayic uh, loss is dominant. We showed that this limits, ultimate limits to the energy are consistent with published data, including our own published data for energy consumption versus resistive loss. We also use this to show uh, on the order of something like 9% thermodynamic efficiency. Uh, we next wanna talk about reduced order models for CDI and, and, and I'll have most of my slides in this part of the talk. Before I start, I'm, I'm gonna have a slide here referring to this very nice uh, sort of uh, review um, uh, type paper that was published by several labs, including uh, my own Lawrence Livermore National Labs, Martin Bischevel and Parada from uh, Wetsus, um, and also from uh, Lawrence Livermore National Labs is Stephen Hawks, the first author, uh, and Patrick uh, Campbell. Uh, Ashwin Ramachandra is my student who worked on the CDI uh, um, work that I'll be showing in mostly in this uh, talk. And this is uh, Matt Suss from Technion. But what we all agreed on is, first of all, thermodynamic efficiency, although interesting to explore ultimate limits, is not the right figure of merit. It's not the right figure of merit of CDI. Instead, the right figure of merit is, uh, we believe, are these four, which are water recovery. This is the volume of produced water relative to the total water. The delta C, the, the amount of concentration decrease uh, uh, through the system the specific energy where energy input is normalized by the amount of produced desalted water. And then the productivity, which is the amount of water produced per unit area of, of electrode and time. And there are no optima or maxima in CDI. It is always a trade-off and it's a trade-off among the four figures of merit that people care about, which are the ones summarized here. If you wanna maximize any one of these, you have to sacrifice at least one other. We, the work I'll show you is we take the full PDEs, partial differential equations, describing the transport, electrotransport, diffusion, and advection of species, even reactions. And we perform a volume average around the entire cell to get a very simplified model, which has been done before. And I'll show you what's the new part of it. Um, where we have the rate of change, we have the uh, efflux minus influx, and then we have the forcing function, which is the electrical. Um, and we like this model because it reflects the variables that you can measure and the variables that you can control in almost every CDI problem. It's also the, probably the, the most simplest yet very useful model uh, that, you, that you can look at in this field. So this type of well stirred reactor model was used by uh, Johnson and Newman back in the early 70s. Um, however, they assumed that all the electrons you put in a mole of electrons you put in give you a mole of salt removal out, which is not really right. And that limitation was best and pointed out by and formulated by Martin Bischevel in his work in 2009, who showed that um, here multiplying this current, you should have this uh, EDL efficiency, this electric double layer efficiency. And that's there because of the nonlinearities of the electric double layers where at low applied voltages, low compared to the thermal voltages, you just have uh, what's been called ion swapping and no re net removal of salt from the cell. Where at high electric fields, then you can start crowding counter ions on each of the electric double layers and you can pull out salt from the bulk. That leads to this hyperbolic tangent type behavior for the 
charge efficiency, where near low voltages, X here is like the applied voltage over the double layer um, relative to the thermal voltage. Near low values, you're not pulling out any salt, but eventually after a couple thermal voltages, you're pulling out one to one. This last one I summarize here is from a paper from 2018 uh, from our collaboration with Livermore. And this was led by Stephen Hawks uh, and uh, senior author was uh, Michael Staterman. But it shows that in fact, when you look at the downstream um, effluent of the salt stream, you can define an, a uh, another of three different efficiencies. One is this uh, electric double layer efficiency, which uh, say average for the cell, a Coulombic efficiency to take into account the Faraday reactions, but also a flow efficiency, which is um, the efficiency associated with incomplete removal of either the desalted water or the brine when you create it. And these three efficiencies are multiplicative. So there are always, all three are always important. Next, I'll describe the simple electrical circuit model that we'll use for CDI. So we treat um, uh, in terms of resistors and capacitors, uh, most simple treatment that will give us useful results. The actual double layer um, for this particular model, we split it into a stern layer and a diffuse layer. I, I will make a comment that that this model and all the comments I'll make are independent of exactly what electric double layer model you choose. We still get similar results for, for any uh, custom double layer model. We have uh, the resistance associated with the ionic uh, uh, spacer, the ionic resistance in the spacer, external leads. This is the diffuse portion, the stern layer. And then we can include uh, an external discharge type uh, resistance um, here. And of course the most Nonlinear component is the diffuse double layer uh, component, and that results in this uh, charge efficiency, which is that hyperbolic tangent. But we're here expressing in terms of prop measurable properties of the cell, including the capacitances and a point of zero charge to account for surface charge, spontaneous surface charge on the electrode surfaces. And in terms of the external variables, the things that we can control, in this case, we have it in terms of current um, and as a function of time. So fairly simple electrical model. For the well stirred reactor model, which I've already described, we can write that equation. And now we combine those two models, right? Uh, so here's this charge efficiency model, which couples into the mass transport through that charge uh, uh, efficiency term, that electric double layer efficiency. We have a Coulombic efficiency term here, which is a area average. You should try to work to keep this to say 0.9 on an area, on a time average basis. Sorry, it's a time average, not an area average. And then this is the forcing function, which um, is like the external current. Um, we have an accumulation term, and then we have the efflux term, all normalized here. There's a natural time scale associated with the mass transport, which is the volume of liquid in the cell divided by the flow rate. And I'll refer to this again and again, but you'll see it shows up in the solutions. Now, inherently, this equation is still nonlinear. And the way we linearize it is by thinking about the electric double layer on a cycle average, on a time average throughout an entire elect uh, electro uh, absorption and desorption uh, uh, phases. So this is from the SI of Ashwin's paper where he showed in close form what the right integrals over the charging phase and the discharging phase should yield in terms of known uh, controllable variables, the properties of the cell, which are an equivalent capacitance and the stern capacitance, as well as the point of zero charge. So he was able to write in close form the cycle averaged charge uh, efficiency. And that is what we then substitute this time varying efficiency. We substitute it with the correct cycle average which is an approximation, but when we do that, now the, now the whole equation becomes linear and we can write solutions in close form, which is what this is. So for the rest of the 
uh, of this section, I'm going to be describing closed form analytical solutions uh, to these dynamics. So there will be a forced res response to the system, which is associated with this forcing function in the applied current. And then the natural response, which is uh, the, the solution to the homogeneous part of this system, where is uh, how long it takes you to clean out the cell once you uh, have some initial condition in the cell that's different than the input. That's uh, we call or that's called and we call the natural response for the CDI. There's also a couple of the variables you have to modify in order to have self similarity um, uh, across all CDI cells. Uh, so one I've already said, which is this uh, normalization of time. You need to think in terms of flow rate per current. That's the variable that collapses data. And also um, the voltages that you apply, the voltage limits in terms of the applied voltages, point of zero charge and currents with equivalent resistances. Okay, so I'll just briefly say we also validate each step of this um, and obtain all of these um, capacitance through experiments. And I'll refer you to the paper for details. Uh, this is our experimental setup. Uh, typical thing with a source meter conductivity sensors in and out peristaltic pump. The cell is five pair with titanium uh, current collections. We have uh, mesh spacers uh, between them. Um, and again, I'll refer you to the paper for more details. So what we do is we first analyze the natural response of the cell. We do that by applying voltage to the cell. The the cell in, in stopped flow with no flow. We remove salt from the spacer. Then we go to an open circuit condition and flow and begin to flow. And what you see is what you expect, which is the amount of salt in the cell drops and then it eventually recovers to the feed value, to the feed concentration. And those dynamics are of course dependent on the amount of voltage that you apply. That's why we have two plots and the flow rate. So higher flow rate means it, re um, it recovers more quickly to the uh, inlet value. And just to show the uh, utility of this model, so now for this type of experiment, there is no force response. It's just responding, changing to a, a different initial condition than the uh, steady state condition. We compare this decaying exponential to the time after about one normalized time scale, where this tau again is the volume divided by the flow rate. And we see that all data collapses across all flow rates in these normalized equations, okay? This initial portion cannot be captured by a well-stirred reactor, but that has to do with a ballistic dispersion, the difference between the interface uh, that first emerges and the interface and mixing that occurs on the back end. But very interestingly, even those ballistic dispersion dynamics are still collapsed by these similarity variables. They're still collapsed by the appropriate scaling of the equation. So you see, even within those experiments, we capture that ballistic dispersion collapse, collapse. Okay. The more important uh, or, and the more interesting case is the forced response when you're varying the current. And here we show data in the inset raw data for different flow rates, which of course doesn't collapse. You see uh, this steady periodic forcing function um, uh, on the cell. In this steady periodic, right, you run so many cycles and you continue to run cycles so that the only important term is this, and it's forgotten its initial condition. But we see that the model, which is the closed form analytical model, the black line, collapses all of the data all across all of these flow rates um, onto a single curve, right? Um, so this is for one uh, flow rate per current and one low voltage value. This is a different flow rate per current, changing the shape of the curves, but again, the model does well. And then this is a different flow rate per current relative to the first and a different uh, voltage. Here we go to a negative voltage. And again, you see the model does very well in capturing this. So this made us very um, uh, 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 confident about this model that we could use it to do gross predictions of the dynamics and, and optimize the cell. And we started thinking, okay, one, now that we have this sort of linearized model which offers closed form solutions, 
what is the response to the CDI system in terms of the salt versus time downstream for arbitrary inputs? Well, it's a linear system. Let's imagine this uh, like a linear transfer function subject to arbitrary inputs. And so it's very natural to talk about a Fourier decomposition. So any periodic, um, uh, for any linear system, you can take periodic inputs. Um, the outputs will be also periodic at the same frequency for a linear system. And we can decompose those inputs and the output in terms of a sum of sine waves. So we do that for the current and voltage. And then we ask, okay, if we control current, what are the outputs going to be? And the outputs will be voltage and the concentration versus time. So we do that and we see this uh, linearity again uh, exhibited in the experiments. So again, the symbols are experiments. The solid line is the model. Um, we have a tenfold changes in frequency here, but they, you see they all have the same normalized frequency when we normalize by the cycle. Um, they're all all input sine waves get output uh, sinusoids, which have a phase shift like any linear system. But we see this very nice collapse of the data. So this idea of a Fourier modes associated with arbitrary inputs of CDI works very well. And if you can imagine what we've done now is we have this transfer function where there's a coupling between the mass transport, the well-stirred mass transport, um, that's shown here by this equation. And then the electrical response um, of this uh, effective linear RC type circuit with, it, with an effective capacitance. And each of these, so this circuit and this well stirred reaction, each is first order and each is linear. So you don't expect anything like resonance. However, they couple, they couple through this forcing function where the electrical forcing comes into the mass transport problem. And the coupling of the two are a second, uh, give, a, give it a second order type um, behavior. And so we observe that there is a closed form solution which identifies a resonant frequency for CDI cells, a resonant frequencies, a resonant frequency. Um, and so here's the closed form solution in terms of the key variables. You have an RC time constant and you also have this tau, which is that flow time constant, the volume per flow rate. And in fact, you can derive a closed form expression for the resonant frequency. It's one over the geometric average of that flow time scale uh, and the RC time scale. So here's the, the, the complex uh, mass transport. Here's the electrical coupling and the two couple to give you this resonance in this theory. So we showed that with experiments here again at more uh, the, the uh, solid lines are um, uh, model versus uh, dashed line experiments. Um, on the top right, we're showing that in a normalized time scale, as you change applied frequency, you always get a sine wave, but then the phase shift changes, and more importantly, the amplitude changes, showing that there's a resonance, right? So this is the, the first uh, evidence of resonance, but that's best seen um, in a plot where we have frequency on the, uh, on the abscissa. And this is a, a frequency normalized by our uh, resonant frequency expression versus concentration. So these are uh, Bode plots. This is like an amplitude and this is this phase shift. And of course, we capture very well this resonant behavior of CDI cells. Um, so, and we feel that this is an important contribution because imagine now any CDI cell running anywhere in the world by using this idea of operating at resonance, you can get maximum maximum um, uh, response in salt concentration, which is a key variable. Um, and that's what. She, and so some of our uh, searches in the literature show that people are operating often far from resonance. So just by a change in the software, a change in, in the control uh, software, they can get significant gains out of their CDI cells. Okay, we also show um, a comparison between model and experimental data. We show this deviation from our simple model and the, exp and the experimental data. <coughs> Excuse me. But this deviation is due to things like the transmission line effects of the electrodes or the fact that you're not cleaning out the cell. Uh, you're not, your frequency is so high that you're not removing the desalted water and the brine at each time. 
that's fine and, and it's all interesting uh, phenomenon. But if you're operating in a regime where this model doesn't apply, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be operating there anyway. Um, you should instead be operating in the resonant regime where the model does do very well. <clears throat> okay. In this plot, what we're showing is the number of Fourier modes required to successfully capture these complex experimental shapes. So again, the symbols are experimental data. The red dash is just using two Fourier modes um, to capture a square wave versus a triangular wave on the right-hand side. And the black line is using 10 Fourier modes, um, uh, better approximating. And we use this type of analyses and experimental data to ask the question, okay, what's, what shape, what should be the shape of the input forcing functions into any CDI cell? And what is the role of the higher order modes? And what we found um, is, is interesting. So the sine wave, you can think of the first order mode of, of any uh, cyclic operation. This is the, 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 nat the, um, um, uh, the, the first term in the Fourier series. And then for square waves, you then need a, a whole series of, of higher frequency sine waves. For triangular wave, you also need that, but they decay much faster. Uh, so you can represent tri triangle waves much easier with a smaller number of terms. And here we're plotting concentration versus normalized frequency, showing that the sine wave doesn't do as well as the square wave in terms of removing salt. For this reason, some people don't like to use things like sine waves. However, when you look at the energy, you see the very large amount of energy cost of the square wave, right? where the sine wave is a much lower energy cost. And when you look at the amount of salt removed per energy, then you see the sine wave just does just, just as well as the triangular wave, and both of those do much better than the square wave. So in fact, the sine wave is a very nice trade-off between um, salt removal, where you remove, say, 80% of the salt of the square wave, but you do so with much less energy penalty and with um, just about optimal um, micromoles or energy per joule relative to these other waves shapes. On the bottom here, we're just showing um, what it is these Fourier modes do. So for example, in the square wave, the first term of this is the sine wave. And as we add more Fourier modes, what we see in the blue curve here is that you remove not much more salt for this uh, example, you remove not much more salt, but there's more of a change in the energy consumption in the red axis here on the right axis. So these higher modes are not removing too much more salt, but these higher modes are consuming energy. These modes required to make those corners are removing energy, those high frequency components. And the same is true for triangular waves or a similar situations for triangle waves where uh, higher modes here are leading to higher salt, which is good. And they both ask them to, to about the same energy consumption, okay? So again, it's about the four figures of merit and the trade-offs among the figures of merit. Okay, before I end, I'm gonna just give a, a quick uh, a shout out here to some other work by my student, Ashwin Ramachandran. This is the third paper of him that I've shown today. Um, and this is, a looking at these sort of self-similar CDI uh, systems, but now he considered variations of flow rate, of the flow rate um, uh, forcing function and showed and looked at a couple different forcing functions, but he showed that a forcing function where you have a high initial flow rate during charging and then a very low flow rate during discharging, he can increase water recovery to about 90% with only very mild uh, changes in the other figures of merit. So th this is a very nice way to get very high water recovery. And I'll refer you to this paper if you want to read more about it. So key takeaways from this part of the talk is we identify these variables for self-similar behavior among all CDI cells. We use these uh, to, develop, to couple a, a first order mass transport, a first order electrical circuit type model and their coupling gives us a, a, a second order type behavior, which identifies a resonant frequency. We also showed how to achieve very high water recovery. 
With that, I'd like to again thank my co-authors, uh, funding source, Tomcat Institute of Stanford, also um, State of California Department of Water Resources, and I'd be happy to take any questions.